So for this one, on a Tuesday, I'm joined by The Athletic's Adam Crafton and our Chelsea writer, Liam Toomey, also a regular on our Chelsea podcast, Straight Out of Cobham. I'm going to come to you in a second, Liam, because I know, I know the angle you're at right now. I listened to the podcast last night. Oof. But Adam, let's start with you. Chelsea say they need more players in the transfer window. I was going to ask if you're surprised, but like, I mean, is it madness considering like what's going on at Chelsea right now? Yeah, well, it's, it's Pochettino, isn't it? After the game, who did they lose to this weekend? Everton. They lost yeah. to this weekend. <laughs> He's going to lose track. Um, <laughs> and he came out and said he, he kind of needs more players, which yeah. tells you he doesn't trust what he's currently got at his disposal to do what he wants to do. But also, I think like most of us watching them feel like they need more players mm. or a higher quality of players. Like Certainly goalkeeper, striker, Probably, I know Chelsea fans keep telling me they've got 15 centre halves, but <laughs> none of them are world class at yeah. this at this stage. So they probably need a, a top class centre half, and they uh, need fullbacks because their best fullbacks can't stay fit. So that's like a starting point. Mm-hmm. So he's right when he says they need more players, but when you've spent over a billion pounds in three transfer windows, it's extraordinary. Like it's genuinely extraordinary that you can spend over a billion be in the bottom bottom half of the table. Twelfth. Mm. Twelfth. I think the stat is something like 35 of the last 45 Premier League games. I keep just going with this one after each game and adding to it <laughs> because I can't believe it. Like For Chelsea not to win 35 of their last 45 Premier League games, barely won a home game this year mm. in the calendar year. This cuts across three or four managers, obviously one ownership. Um, it's really bad. Mm. Like, really, really bad. And... We'll get into this, but like we don't know what the impact is yet of a second year outside the Champions League. That's the big question. Like you can keep talking about like we need to spend more money. Well, where is it going to come from? Mm-hmm. Because it's not going to come from revenue. Yeah, I mean, I just want to pick up on that. I mean, it's not really all about spending money. We've seen clubs spend less money and, and, and do far better. Um, I think that Everton game felt like a bit of a reality check, didn't it? for Chelsea fans I mean I feel like another one several reality (laughs) checks if you think about it but it's much more nuanced than just saying we need more money in in another window Liam yeah to be fair I think a lot of the Chelsea fans I've been speaking to and I spoke to a few outside Goodison Park before the Everton game are living in this reality Mm. I don't think they have any illusions about where Chelsea are because they've been a mid-table Premier League team for more than a year now Um, but just picking up on, on, on Adam's point I mean they don't really have many world-class players, but that's almost an inevitable consequence of the transfer strategy because mm. how many world-class 22-year-olds are there? Like how many 22-year-olds or players 23 or younger make the Ballon d'Or mm. top 10? Or, how, know, how, how can you buy players for £100 million that aren't world-class? But also expect to make a profit on those players, right? Like at that age yeah I mean well, to... I suppose that's like that's two points right yeah. so like first question is you sign players that are worth what, what Enzo Fernandez over 100 million well they're not worth what they paid exactly. but yeah. no but that's yeah. what they exactly paid right. yes. and Caicedo 115 150, 150 right it's implausible to me yeah. that you can spend that money on players that we're sitting here and saying aren't oh, world class mm. yeah. that's insane right so Jude Bellingham is worth that because he's world class those play Enzo Fernandez is not a one a one hundred million pound player. I mean, there's there's no world in which he is that. But that's the market that they've kind of created mm. and normalised. Um, and then the other point that, that that you were making, I've forgotten about but, making a profit. Yes. So about making like if the idea is that you take some of these players young and then maybe you have them for three or four years. Mm. I suppose they either become legends at your club and stay for ten years because you put them on really long contracts, mm. or you flip them, mm. which may be what they're doing with some of those younger players they're taking from Brazil, mm. give them a bit of action, mm. then sell them on. But it can't be the plan with... Like, you're not going to make a profit on Moises Caicedo. No, and I think, you know, we risk getting into the yeah. football finance weeds yeah, here, but true. I think their mm. their strategy is probably not we're thinking of selling Moises Caicedo for 200 million mm. in five years' mm. time. Job. It's more <laughs> <laughs> He's going to buy. It's more that on the books, he won't be worth... You know, he, his remaining value will mean that you won't need to sell him for as much as you bought him for in order to register a profit on the books, which is all they really care about. But I think maybe less so with Caicedo and, and Enzo, who do look like very good players and maybe could be world-class in the next few years, if not right now. 
there are other players that they've bought. You know, we've discussed Mudrick before on 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 the pod who have the potential to be sort of complete busts at this level. Mm. Um, it's too soon to tell, but that that is a big financial risk to take because you may not be able to sell them at all. Never mind. 60 million or whatever the upfront fee was and the fl- and then you have the flip side of these very very long contracts whereas if it's going well you look at that and think wow we've got we this player tied this, tied you know. down you know maybe the salary goes up bit by bit year by year but generally we've got all the power whereas now it's like mm. we're stuck with this guy for the next six years mm. yeah. and or, who's gonna who's gonna buy it or if you've got players that have what increasingly appear to be chronic injury issues on long-term contracts, which already seems to be the case with Wesley Fofana, Reese James. Every new injury he gets is a great cause for concern. Both of those guys are tied down on big mm-hmm. money for a long time. You know, and it's great. It, obviously, the injuries aren't great for them, but the the being on long-term contracts is great security for those guys. But mm. the benefit to Chelsea is not. not. <laughs> yeah, but then I go back to it again, like. Who's advising these people? (laughs) Who's advising these people? Because the reality is, like, these are these are huge gambles to make on on players you're not really sure of, players the world isn't even sure of yet. You know, like, who is advising these people? Well, they've Bowley and Clearlake have come in, you know, with with this strategy of turning the squad into an investment portfolio. That's what they've done. They've bought all of these young players, and they are then you know they're not unrealistic enough to think all of these players will work out they're playing in their minds quite a sort of cool-headed uh, numbers game that more of these players will go up in value over time than down and you'll get team success to go along with that the, but the the problem is there are maybe variables that they've underestimated that certainly one of them was they thought they could just rip, rip the club apart and rebuild it from scratch and stay in the top four which you know was exposed hugely last season I think they underestimated the strength of the Premier League and it's proving the case this year and and, you know to pick up on what Adam said earlier how long is the runway for this Mm. for you know you you front loaded this investment and all this young talent these guys may need a bit of time to if they're ever going to be what you think they can be they may need a bit of time to, to do that individually and to become a team that can do something serious in the league and by then has has the financial backing run out to the point where you have to make different financial decisions and start selling players you don't want to sell, mm. selling some of the success stories mm. in order to rectify some of the mistakes you've made? I always think about the uh, the nuances around football. We saw the Tottenham game, whoa, <laughs> Chelsea, come on. We saw the City game, oh, 4-4, let's have it, come on. And the reality is we're still back to where we started, Liam. Yeah, and I think maybe part of that is is a young team mm-hmm. you know they they've had a couple of what felt like full storms this season and at times it's felt like they raise or lower their game to the standard of the opposition you know th- their best performances of the season have come against liverpool arsenal manchester city spurs i think sits alone as just a crazy farce of a game um but they they've also really struggled i think as much with the pressure of being favourites against mm. teams like Brentford and Nottingham Forest, um, who are very well drilled and know exactly what Chelsea's weaknesses are. Um, but now they're losing games in different ways. Yeah. So at the start yeah. of the season, you could say it was just the teams that come to Stamford Bridge, mm. sit back. That's not an unfamiliar problem for an evolving team, right? You're learning how to break them down. I think what's happened over the last two weeks is way more worrying. Yeah. Right? The United like, game was the, the, really United, the United game, the Newcastle game, and then the Everton game. Their games were actually, you've kind of just been bullied. Yeah. Bullied and outrun and outworked, really, and not competed, which those games away from home, if you, if you kind of, you have to kind of earn the right to play a little bit in those games and match what's being put into it. And Chelsea, Chelsea aren't doing that. And I think those are the games that Pochettino will be way more worried about, actually, I think, than Nottingham Forest. Because yeah. Nottingham Forest at home, you buy a striker that scores mm. and you win that game. Mm. What's happened over the last couple of weeks, I think, is way more indicative of a collective well, issue. And I think you've seen that in the change in Pochettino's demeanour mm. in the well, last yeah, few we'll weeks. Talk about that as well. I mean, yeah. on the sidelines. Yeah. Well, and also what he's said in interviews and press mm. conferences, because I think after the, 
the Newcastle game. That was the first time he really publicly lit a fire mm. under the players. He's mm. he's protected them. He's been very patient, very emotionally measured. But he he, he but, said we didn't compete. But, and, but where do you go after you've done that? Because yeah. it's not had a reaction. It's had a negative reaction. Well, I I would say that I think they did compete against Everton. Um, I, they weren't physically bullied. I don't mm. think in that game. That wasn't how they lost it. It was that game was actually a little bit more similar to the the home games they've lost this year, and they got diced basically. Mm. Um, like uh, yeah, so I I think they they did show reasonable energy in that game, um, but after that, for him to come out and then say, you know, we might need better players, he didn't necessarily say more players, but it was more ruthlessness in the mm -hmm. final third, maybe a different profile. We need to look at January. And he wasn't breaking news inside Chelsea with those comments because as as far back in October, we wrote that Chelsea were looking at January as maybe the window to go and get a forward, not necessarily a striker, mm -hmm. a forward who could operate across the front line. Another one. Another one. Well, yes. there is there is one that people were excited about was Nkunku, right? Yes. And, pff, I mean, it's barely... It's not kicked a ball this season, really. I mean, are we... Are you worried by the length of this injury? Is this what you expect? Did people no. expect that? I think it fits the time frame yeah, yeah, that we were told when he picked up the injury at Dortmund. I mean, it was brutal timing because of the importance he had in the team in pre-season and mm -hmm. the way Pochettino had to change things. Um, but I do think it, it, it makes what we've heard about Chelsea looking at forwards a bit strange because mm -hmm. they can't possibly know what they do or don't have in Nkunku yet. You know, he, he might be... A superstar in the Premier League, he might be someone who's genuinely transformative on the players around him. A player who's been injured for that long yeah. to get to speed with a new league. Exactly. Or he might be another Bundesliga signing that, that struggles to be as productive in England or anything in between. The mm. point is, we don't know. And it, I, I find it quite strange that you know you could consider making a, a large, because it would be a large recruitment decision in January that would have implications for the other attackers you already have. When you've just got this big and kunku question mark that you ha you can't answer yet, for sure. Well, I tell you, one striker Chelsea definitely can't call upon in January is of course Romelu Lukaku, who remains on loan in Serie A. Yeah, I mean, the Lukaku one's dead, isn't it, <laughs> Liam? Yeah, uh, mutual antipathy. I think you know that if you're looking for the reason why a recall clause wasn't mm -hmm. put in that loan, it was because none of the parties involved wanted one. Um, the, the bridges are very much burned. I don't, you know, as much as Chelsea are struggling to score against certain teams this season, mm. there's been zero clamour from the fans to see Lukaku mm. back. Uh, I don't think many of them are particularly interested or keeping track of how he's done at, at Roma this season. Um, and I think Chelsea's hope as a club is just that he scores enough goals between now and the summer that they can actually persuade someone to buy him and get his wages off the books permanently. Yeah, I was just thinking about this whole Chelsea situation and uh, the kind of pressure that's on someone like Poch's shoulders. People say, oh, is he going to be there? Is he not? I mean, it's a lot of this is stuff is he, he's already inherited. He must have known this was the situation. When you take that job, you bring your team in, right? Mm. Come on, boys. We're going to fix this. <laughs> yeah. Get your pliers. Let's go. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I mean, I don't think there's any... There's a huge amount that would have surprised mm. Pochettino from since he's taken over. I think he'll be worried about the lack of response he's getting from the players in terms of just attempting to sort of implement his style and how long that's taking. Given, you know, Chelsea haven't had European football, mm. so they've had a lot of time on the training ground to work on the things he wants to work on. And we've seen bits of that in those games against Manchester City in particular. But equally, I look at that City and I'm like, that's probably the kind of team Chelsea want to play mm. because they don't make compromises. They don't and they play high up the pitch and give you space. Yeah. Mm. Um, so it appeals, I think, to, to, to this Chelsea team to play a game like that. And there's no expectation on that game. Mm. Whereas whenever there's expectation, I think Chelsea find it way harder. Um, I think it's always worth, with any of these conversations around Chelsea, like taking a step back mm. and remembering what the owners inherited. And I think sometimes there is a temptation from us in the media, from Chelsea fans, to think of the Abramovich era as this sort of linear, successful path, that it just wasn't. It was like functionally dysfunctional or dysfunctionally functional, right? Like it didn't make sense in any of the, the ways that we talk about modern football clubs around, you know, having best-in-class chief executives, heads of recruitment. It was basically Abramovich and his pals, right, who were running 
that Chelsea club and it, it worked, right? Like they won Chaos and trophies. Yeah. Chaos and trophies. But the trophies out you know, sure. glazed over what was yeah. actually happening in the background. But but I think it was very much a kind of a culture of pay now, think later. Yeah. Right? And uh, whereas it's almost been pay now, think think Well now think it's ahead, buy now, right? now it's buy now, pay later. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um so I, I think they had a lot to do when they came in. So which is good in some ways, because I think from a commercial point of view, Chelsea have way more potential than they were actually unlocking under Abramovich in terms of sponsorship and revenues and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and they've hired a lot of people since they've gone in. I don't mean, I don't mean players here. I mean... <laughs> have to cram them into yeah, the changing room. Yeah, all, all, yeah, all on the spare pitch at Cobham. <laughs> But no, I mean, you've got like a new CEO, you've got a new COO, you've got a new C uh, mm. CFO, new uh, revenue officer, new communications officer. So they have been rebuilding a club in a lot of different ways and trying to reassess the culture across the whole club. You know, two new sporting directors, had several new head coaches, right? So all of this stuff's been going on in the background that makes a lot of sense in terms of the way that we think about how football clubs should be structured mm and built but at the same time it's not cutting through into success mm. so therefore that the obvious temptation is just think oh we miss the, the rich dude that sort of just made us win trophies mm. but i also think it's like you know when you when, you, when you've got a startup right you hire all these people mm. not all of them are going to be good and it's going to take time before you figure out who <laughs> who's decent and who lied on their cv do you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah and, I, and, I, and i think that's where the other big problem is I think for a lot of Chelsea fans at the moment is that you have to trust the people that are making all those hires and the decisions that they are going to get more of those decisions right than wrong um, and we've already seen some of those hires depart after mm. a less less than a year um, and I just think generally when you when you add what's been happening on the pitch to the the, the sense of flux that there still is just around the club um, I think a lot of fans still have questions about Todd Bowley, Bedadeg Bali, just their their know-how mm. when it comes to football and the football business. We know Bowley's had success in baseball. They're continuing to make and waves in baseball. Big money with in the baseball Dodgers. at the moment, yeah. Um, this is Bedadeg Bali's first involvement with the football club, as far as I know. Uh, and, you know, so that it's hard to just believe that these guys are going to get right get it right i think especially when the the pain of the early stages of this rebuild has been so acute for for chelsea fans let's just believe that january potentially might be a, a little way out liam uh, 150 million for us man it'll all be fine <laughs> that's what i wanted to hear that's yeah. what i wanted to hear i mean like, what are the realistic names i know you did mention a forward i mean would us come to this well that's the other big thing isn't it is you know every window you go every window you get to where you're mid-table mm -hmm. I think it becomes progressively harder to, to pitch some of the most coveted players in Europe that, that you're joining this grand project that's destined to scale the heights mm -hmm. of, of football um, and you're panicking and you're overcorrecting, right? Yeah. you're trying to correct the last mistake you made mm -hmm. we've seen this with Manchester United for a decade mm -hmm. you chase the last mistake by thinking you know you need to sign these two players to make this one player work. You know, sort of Pogba. How many times did Man United buy a player to try and unlock Paul Pogba at Manchester United? And it just didn't happen. And that's the danger for Chelsea, that they start thinking, if we get this guy to play with Mudrick, maybe that'll work out. Or this guy to play with um, Nicholas Jackson, maybe that'll work out, you know, whichever example it is. I think they thought that with Enzo. Mm. Right? I'm not saying they thought Enzo was a mistake or anything like that, but definitely they thought if we pair Enzo and, Caice and Caicedo, that will be unstoppable. And now you're looking at, like, you probably need a third midfielder. Yeah, it's like playing PlayStation, Adam. Like, two great stats, 83-83, put them in the middle, it'll be fine. Well, it's also the, the, the fundamental folly, I think, of, of, of transfers is that you look at the player and you completely ignore the team context in mm -hmm. which they succeeded at their previous club. So Chelsea uh, have done that. Meant they did that under Abramovich many times as well, where he, they they just fall in love with a player, and pay whatever it took to get him, and then put him in a completely different situation, often a different position mm. at Chelsea, and expect the same production. And it just doesn't work like that. Smart clubs know how to buy players and put them in the 
the best positions to succeed. And there's also just so many unknown variables when, when you get a play. You look at the exceptional attackers in the Premier League right now. With the exception of Haaland, none of them were regarded as exceptional when they arrived at their clubs. Like when Son came from Hamburg, no one knew he was going to be, I think, one of the greatest signings of the Premier League era. He's a phenomenal player. Salah from Roma, the same. Um, Saka was not the Chelsea highest let go reg- off, by the way <laughs> yeah but I mean no one I think you talk to anyone around that time no one knew Salah was going to yeah. be this and mm. um, Saka was not the highest regarded youngster at, in Arsenal's academy at the time so y- you don't always know there is actually a chance that Chelsea have one of these players on their books already mm. but because they're all so young and they're not necessarily in the right position to succeed there's no way of knowing yet and they may never be if you don't get the conditions right on an FFP level can they do silly business unless they wrangle the? Co- I mean, like, what, what's the? What's I mean, the real what, chat here. One thing I would expect is that any significant spending in January will be offset by sales. I think there are players that we're looking at in this squad right now. You know, Who? Ian, yeah. Ian Matson, uh, Trevor Chalaber, Conor Gallagher's future remains very much up in the air. Really interesting. Well, because until his contract is resolved mm. one way or the other, you know, he's been heavily. Heavily linked with moves in the last two windows, so he he'll be in the final eighteen months of his deal in January. Um, so that and how do, how do Chelsea fans feel about the possibility of losing another academy, academy graduate? graduate? Do they care? Yeah. I think it depends who it is. You know, given how little Chalaba Matson have featured, I think mm-hmm. there'll be some kicking up about that, but it'll probably be on the margins. If it's Gallagher, who's been one of Chelsea's one or two best players this season albeit it's been a fairly low bar to clear Mm. um, I think there will be big problems Um, I think there will be a a big uh, a big kind of backlash against that because he's he's also one of the players who's shown the most consistent energy um, Mm. on the pitch he's been a he's he's looked like he's sort of growing into being a a captain Mm. and I mean, this is quite a novel thing at Chelsea. He's fit all the time. He's always available. Unless he picks up two yellow cards and gets mm-hmm. himself suspended for a game, he actually is available to play. Through fitness, he plays yeah. at Chelsea. It's amazing. So I think um, he would actually be a, a big loss. I mm. mean, maybe they're thinking if Lavia comes back, you know, he would mitigate that. But forget, he hasn't played a minute yet. I was going to say, we, we spoke about this before the pod. Hasn't kicked a ball for Chelsea. Yeah. 50, Paid all that money. £53 million pound signing. Hasn't played a minute. Well, I mean, Jurgen Klopp alluded to uh, some midfielders they missed out on <laughs> over the transfer window uh, not too long ago. Um, but <laughs> we talk about strikers, the midfield, big issues here. Also, defensively, big issues here. I mean, where do we even start with Reese James, club captain? Barely fit. Hmm. It's just a really sad football story, I think, um, because he is Chelsea's best player when he's fit and right, and he's one of the best right backs in the world. Um, but when he's fit and right is becoming an increasingly uh, hopeful disclaimer uh, on his career. We're talking about close to two years now of him being really a, a theoretical superstar. And that's a problem for a guy that you've made your captain and your symbol um, and the person that you're you're putting a lot and, of hopes on. And, and also when you think of the players that Chelsea actually had come through as fullbacks over yeah. the last mm-hmm. few years and have let go. So it was like watching Tino Livermento yeah. play Newcastle. play really well for Newcastle Amazing. at the moment and thinking he should be playing for Chelsea mm. right like I, I understand the sort of the chain of circumstances that mean he doesn't play for Chelsea mm. because at that time they didn't, you know they felt like James was going to be the guy and as Piliqueta was still their club captain oh, yeah. yeah but 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 I think that's a failure of Chelsea for Chelsea to have a player that good come through your academy and not be playing for Chelsea Tariq Lamptey has also had sort of injury yeah. issues as well, yeah, right. but he's another player that should have been part of Chelsea's squad, really, at the time where they let him go, and that he should have been given a chance there. And I think it's you, you sort of see this a bit with Man City and a bit with Chelsea, where you've had these kind of huge investments over a long time into the academy, and you have some really, really talented players coming through, but they just the vast majority just don't really end up getting. A fair, yeah. a fair shake at it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and that's those two players in particular. You know, those were situations that came to a head in the Abramovich era. That I'm sure the new owners mm. would say these are things we inherited. But they've 
potentially sowing the seeds for more of those situations to play out in the next few years because it was bad enough b- before in the Abramovich era where you had seasoned internationals yeah. and, and older players in front of you in the in the queue. But now, players in at Cobham who are coming through will see guys under the age of 23 who've mm-hmm. been signed for massive fees ahead of them thinking, well, they're going to be there for mm. you know seven, eight years maybe if they do well. So where's the pathway for me? Mm, for sure. Right, let's, let's move on to Poch. I'm fascinated by this one because obviously we saw what he did at Spurs then he went to PSG and you'd think as a team you know a project like Chelsea would be the real testing ground I I always don't want to write PSG as anyone's script really because you know what goes on there Mm. but in terms of what this team can do Chelsea should feel like the perfect project for them Adam for Poch yeah yeah I mean in theory right you look at the job he did at Spurs, you take sort of a group of young players, you build together. Uh, what I would say is it didn't it didn't happen quickly at Spurs. Yeah. You know, it did take half a season for him to have a bit of a turning point and start clicking. Um Southampton it happened a lot quicker for him. That was also another group of young players. But I think he did have in both those teams more experienced players alongside, alongside those younger yeah. players. Yeah. That whereas at Chelsea at the moment, okay, he's got Thiago Silva, but Thiago Silva's on his last legs, really. Um, I know he still has games where he looks brilliant in moments. Was he benched for the Everton game? Did he play? Yeah, I yeah. think that was probably being rested. Um, although it's for a bit what? of a running joke on our Chelsea podcast. What was he rested for? Because he's played basically every game oh, this season. Yeah. So it, There's no game midweek? N- no. <laughs> no. It's been... I can imagine Adam as a manager, can't you? <laughs> what, why are you wrestling, mate? <laughs> Snow game midweek. Re- rested you're, the... you're 45. What are you doing? <laughs> rested for the big training session on Tuesday. Very much the Mourinho school of just yeah. ignoring <laughs> the players on the treatment table. No, I, I would be let go out of, out, of, out of mutual discontent very, very, very quickly. Um, so you've got him and Sterling. That's probably it, really, mm, yeah. in terms of those sort of experienced players. I think Sterling's had a really good season, yes. to be honest. Yeah. Like, I think he's... I was why was he not playing on Sunday? Why wasn't he starting on Sunday? Again, I think it was probably a case of another one rested. Yeah, I, honestly, because it's a, it's a weird situation in that yes, on paper Chelsea have this massive squad, but they've basically had ten players out injured at all times mm-hmm. since January, which is just a crazy situation, and it means that Pochettino has lent on twelve, thirteen players for the last two months, um, and Sterling, and if you look at the minutes totals I think Sterling and, and Silva would probably both be top two or top three or four I, of the outfielders I, I think that makes it worse for him because actually I almost feel like if you looked at Chelsea last season you thought like the problem that Lampard had was like oh my god I've got so many players I have to shuffle in shuffle out whereas actually Pochettino has had a pretty fi- reasonably fixed group of players mm. you know to build relationships and build partnerships mm. and build a style of play a lot of time on the training ground and it's not really come out on the field. It's not like they've been losing. You know, most of the players who have been playing have been fit most of the season, right? Yeah, in the, th- across the spine of the team. I think what you've seen in a lot of games is that there has been a pattern of play between the two boxes in terms of it, it has been much more identifiable the way Pochettino is trying to play than the than, for example, what we saw with Graham Potter last year, where he he seemed to lose faith in his own idea. Mm. quite quickly and mm. then it was changing from week yeah. to week um, but the problem is they've been a lot of the time really uh, wasteful in the attacking box and then they will always make at least one mistake in 90 minutes that will give the other team a but really good chance to win the game but that's why and it's easy to say now but I felt at the time when, when everyone was saying for the first few weeks of the season oh but you know what it was, like, it was like Turkey before the Euros last a couple of years ago. It's like, watch out for Chelsea with their XG because, you know, <laughs> once once they start clicking. And it was like, no, they don't have good enough players in both boxes. So that's not, it's not, an, it, it is an XG issue, but it's not an XG issue because actually if you just don't have the quality the not there. in both boxes, mm. you're not going to fix that. It's the issue with the X. It's the expectations. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, you can yeah. say that a lot about Chelsea fans. <laughs> the expectations, right. really. So like, you can talk about the XG, but like, I don't know, my expectation of what Nicholas Jackson's going to do is what he's doing. Mm. To be honest, like, have a few good games, a few bad games, 
be a bit in and out because that's his, kind of his track record. Well, and he's been uh, a striker at senior professional level for less exactly. than a year. Yeah. Exactly. And he's being asked to lead the line for a club with Chelsea's aspirations. Can yeah. you then say that, I mean, like, you bring this relatively experienced manager into this squad with a l- bunch of young players and we've sort of highlighted um, the lack of, for a better word, quality in certain respects. Can you say he's improved any of those players? It's hard to say. Um, Sounds like a no. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be the most yeah. diplomatic ever. I mean, well, I'm thinking, uh, but the fact that I'm Cole thinking Palmer. probably is an answer. I don't know. Cole Palmer came in and was good. You mm. know, he was good from the moment he started playing. So I, I don't know whether he's improved. I think. What, if, about, what about these? So they've got all these centre backs. Yeah. So Colwell, uh, Badia Shiel, and. Disassi. 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 Mm. Who's the best? Who's the best of them? What's the I partnership? Colwell and, and Badia Shiel, I think, both have the potential to be really, really top in their positions. Colwell's been playing at left back mm-hmm. all season, partly because Chilwell's been injured, and partly because I think um, Kukurea Kukurea. can't be consistently relied upon. Um, which, of course, is another recruitment question. Um, Badia, Badia Shiel started the season injured, so he's been. I think we'll probably see more of him than we have. Mm-hmm. And Pochettino has lent on. Silver in the back line, I think, because yeah. of what you mentioned, because there's so little experience everywhere else. And he's decided to try and prioritise a partnership between him and Dizassi, which has actually looked OK in isolation. It mm. hasn't it hasn't led to one of the Premier League's best defensive records, I think, because of the whole thing, not just because of them. Mm. Mm-hmm. At what point then? I mean... I think Chelsea love a long-term project. Um, no, 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 they, no, they, they, they love, didn't no, used to. No, <laughs> they love saying that they love a long-term project. <laughs> Even with these owners, I mean, we don't. We, I mean, they say they've got a long-term project, mm. but they said that when Graham Potter was there. This is also true. So they have to prove it, actually, that that they believe that you know. Cause everyone can say we've got a plan, but then, you know, the plan changes. But then, right? for me, it's like when. Is he under pressure? Because for so long, Graham Potter wasn't under pressure. There, very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah, I mean, Potter was, was safe until he wasn't. Mm. That was the messaging. And, you know, that's where we are with Pochettino. He, you know, the, the guidance is unchanged. He's the guy that they're, they're leaning on to lead this. And, I mean, he's not on a long-term contract in the way that Potter was. Mm. So I think it will be How re-evaluated. Long contract? He, he will have one guaranteed year left to run this summer um, with, an, with, an, wow. with an option beyond that. So there will be an evaluation, I'm sure, and the un- the thing that we just don't know. So, is so the contract he signed was two plus one. I believe so. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, Maybe he put that in because he probably looked at it. And well, thought, I mean, it doesn't scream long term. Yeah, it doesn't. No. exactly cu- counteracting the idea of a long term project. But that's I think that's it. part. That was probably partly a reaction to mm. them getting burned so much by mm. giving Potter and his backroom staff such mm. long term deals, and then having to. Well, I don't think they paid all of it up, but they were on the hook for a lot of money. But what it does mean, I mean, I think Chelsea will, as a club, probably just accept this season they're not finishing in the Champions League. I think they're going to have to accept that because we're 14 points behind. Fourth, fifth place may become yeah. a possibility. Um, but then I, th- you know. I think the highest they've been is 10th this season, isn't it? They've not yeah. been above 10th. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I still think they will. they will end up seventh certainly seventh or highest i think there will be at some point they'll get their act together maybe there, ha- there has um, been a history of pochettino teams being stronger in the second half yeah, of seasons uh, yeah, than the first uh, and the, you know they're probably not going to be you know they're not obviously not going to be in europe second half of the season they should get players back so they should have a, a bit of a push but i think chelsea will probably accept one one more year outside of the european mm. stage but the problem poch will then have is if that contract is Two plus one means if he's two months into next season and they've not started well, well, his contract's up in the summer anyway. Yeah. Right? So actually, he starts next season on the hot seat. Essentially. On the hot seat, mm. you know, under a huge amount of pressure. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's, that's pretty much where we are. I, I don't know for a fact what Chelsea's reaction will be if they don't qualify for the Champions League this year, which, as you know, you only have to look at the table to know what pipe dream it looks right now. Um, they shouldn't. I mean, they don't deserve to be. I mean, <laughs> in the you know, Arsenal, what you've got Arsenal, Liverpool, Man City, definitely. Definitely. I think Spurs will definitely be in the top five Newcastle? based on how they're playing. I think the killer for them yeah. has been Villa. Villa. Yeah. You've got to go Villa. I'd that, go Villa at the moment. Yeah. How I mean, how? Well, how, why how can't you? you? Like, I mean, yeah. If we're talking fifth, yeah. Yeah. 
Then I think the killer for Chelsea in terms of this season, aside from their own struggles, is that Spurs have have rebounded from ha- selling Harry Kane better than anyone expected mm. in terms of their fast start, and Villa have just come from well, not nowhere because they did finish mm. last season well, but you know they're competing at a and, level that and, 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 didn't think. Ange is a problem for some of these managers. You know, Pochettino, Ten Hag. Yeah. He didn't need time. He didn't mm. go into a club that was. You know, settled in the boardroom, settled in the transfer Very window, settled in the dressing room. Mm. He's gone in. The style's clear. Okay, they don't win every week, but their fans like going to the matches. Generally, are getting good results. They were exactly where they'd want to be in the table. You'd say, maybe one place higher, mm. and that that's a problem because it, I think other fans look at that and being like, "Well, how hard can it be?" Yeah, and they've also they also went and made a couple of signings that were immediately. Sp- yeah. Big impact signing. Yeah, and this is had, the research, and, proper but, but, research on but, these players. But, and they've had injuries, yeah. right? True. So we can talk True. about Chelsea's injuries, True. Man United's yeah, injuries, sure. Spurs have had injuries. Um, you know, I think the teams at the top haven't had injuries to quite the same extent. Mm-hmm. Villa haven't, but Newcastle have, and they're still having pretty, you know, that points gap between Chelsea and well, even Man United. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> if we think about how bad Man United have been, <laughs> and then Chelsea are like down with. Who are they level on points with now? Bournemouth? I'm not actually yeah. sure. That, yeah. you know, the way they're going, they'll be <laughs> overtaking soon. All right, let's quickly round this up. Um, I mean, it's like, how do you solve the world's problems? How does Chelsea move on from this, Liam? I mean, what, what, what needs to happen over the next few months, well, up until May anyway, for, for them to even stand a chance of having an OK enough season whereby we see them finishing seventh, as Adam would say? I think they need the injury situation to ease with, with regard to certain players. I think they need to see what they have with Nkunku. And in order for them to be anything in the Premier League, they probably need him to be good quite quickly. Who are the injured players? That, that, that I mean, James, Chilwell. OK, but they're um, not going to stay. No, I mean, Lavia, Lavia, Lavia. Lavia and Nkunku are probably the two that will come back soonest. Um, and we, again, we don't really know what to expect from mm. Lavia, but maybe he's a player that can come in and make an impact as well. Um, so who, if he comes into the team, who's who's dropping out? It could be Gallagher. It could be rotation for Enzo Fernandez, who's played every single game of football for two years, I think, <laughs> since leaving South America. One game a week. No, but not last year. <laughs> not last year. Uh, last no. year he played every yeah. game, even though Chelsea had nothing to play for. They probably yeah. should have shut him down along with Rhys James um, because he looks like he's running through treacle at the moment, uh, Fernandez. Mm. Um, so that, I think they... I think they need the injury situation to ease, but they also need Pochettino, Pochettino's methods to start taking a bit more hold. I don't think they necessarily need big transfers. I think they actually need a little bit of stability now. Mm. Um, I think, honestly, significant transfer activity could set them back again. If they decide to chop and change this squad too much in January, we could end up in a situation similar to last season where you have just a, a squad that's in a bit of a mess what, so the one thing we've not talked about what's the sort of the atmosphere amongst fa- match going fans mm. because I think that's the one thing that has the yeah. ability to shift when owners see that they panic that's what shifted the uh, landscape for yeah. Potter last season in a big way and I've actually been surprised at how little hostility there's been to Pochettino given his Spurs past I thought if he had a slow start that would immediately become a stick to to beat him with but I think things got so bad last season Mm. Mm. (laughs) that fans were willing to see the green shoots Mm. no matter how sparse they might have been in performances and go with it that is you know running low I think especially over the last four games because Mm. the last three defeats have been really alarming Um, it's more towards the ownership though there is a lot of hostility from the match-going fans in particular towards the ownership, not just because of what's happening on the pitch, but because of stuff we talked about before, decisions they've made um, with the match day experience. P- p- there's a widespread expectation that season ticket prices will go up for the first time in more than a decade mm. early next year, and that could be a tipping point as like well. Like beyond sort of the price of inflation? Not to sound too forgiving, <laughs> but... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I mean, they were frozen for basically right. the last 10 years of the Abramovich era from the 2012 season onwards. Um, so it, you, can, you can make an argument that it's a financial reality to raise season mm. ticket prices at Chelsea and long overdue. But if you raise them 
when you're 12th yeah, yeah, yeah. in the league yeah, yeah. Sure. And you're with very little football. credit in the bank yeah. sure. uh, you're going to expect some blowback well also just finish on this one you know there's a big meeting with the Premier League shareholders today that threatens you know to further undermine this sort of transfer activity uh, that Chelsea well their strategy I should say as opposed to activity uh, that Chelsea have sort of shown under the, the Bowley Clear Lake uh, capital owners um, could it be completely scrapped this long term contract um well, I don't, I don't think they're talking about banning long-term contracts. Mm. I think they're talking about capping the amortisation for the financial calculations mm. at five years, which is what UEFA have already done. So Chelsea essentially got one one window where they uh, were able to really, in their minds, exploit this loophole. Um, and this is when they were doing all this sort of seven-year, eight-year seven contracts. Seven-year, eight-year yeah. deals. And the yeah. idea is you can spread the payments over the course of those eight years. Yeah, so it's a lower annual cost, even though it's a higher transfer fee. So that Chelsea went for that in a big way in January, and that was the the window that they had when before UEFA had legislated mm. against it, which they now have. Um, so I think Chelsea internally were probably expecting that the Premier League would at least discuss doing similar. Um, even though I, I, you know, I've been told consistently they. Chelsea still believe in in long term contracts mm. as a as I a thing. That. I see no one else has copied it yet. No, no. I think uh, it's because you end up with <laughs> well, what there, we're seeing now on the been, field. There hasn't been much incentive to copy it so far. No. Yeah. All right, gents, let's end it here. there. Liam, uh, Adam, thank you so much for your time. Remember to rate and review the podcast if you are enjoying it. A one year subscription is still at the special discounted price of nineteen ninety nine. That's dollars and pounds. Also, simply head over to theathletic.com forward slash football pod. Thanks for listening. Back tomorrow. If you like this video, click subscribe for more content like this. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Lanker, and plenty more through the season to bring you the inside track to the biggest stories in football. If you'd like to listen to the full episodes for free, search The Athletic Football Podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. <laughs>